for then. Uh, this presentation ties nicely actually into uh, Laurent's um, uh, talk. Um, I'm going to talk about an integrated gas and electricity model that we have developed uh, and published on. Um, I'm not going to go into all the technical details and results. All that wonderful stuff is in a peer-reviewed published paper. I'd encourage you to read it and cite it heavily in your research. Please, uh, it'd be great. Instead, I'm going to talk about a lot of the problems that we had in developing this model and some of the stuff uh, maybe that might relate actually to the questions we had around prices and wholesale, uh, the interaction between uh, prices and electricity markets and gas markets. Um, so we have developed, if this doesn't... It's not moving forward. Control L. Control L. Okay, hang on. So this is do the old-fashioned way. Okay. Okay. It might take longer than expected, but uh, we're getting there. So we've developed a uh, an open data, freely available uh, integrated gas and electricity model uh, for the EU28, or as we will be calling it next year, the EU27 and the UK. So you can decide whether to leave the UK in the model or not, but it's all there for you. Uh, we've developed this model in the commercial software platform called Plexus. Now, commercial is a, uh, Plexus is a commercial tool, uh, but it's available free of charge for academic research under conditions of strict non-commercial uh, non -commercial use. So this model is freely available to a lot of academic uh, researchers. Um, we have published on this um, uh, model and tomorrow at the uh, open forums I'll be talking about the wonderful difficulties about trying to publish an open data model in a journal that's not necessarily set up to accept open data. Uh, so come along to that if you're interested. Um, the model is for the target year 2030. The tool that we use is Plexos. Again, it's a commercial tool, but it's transparent and auditable. So we can interrogate the LP equations, we can export them, and we can uh, view them. The software itself is used in about 200, premises, 200 licenses around the world with about 1,000 users. Um, so we have good interaction with a lot of these um, um, uh, commercial users. Uh, the model is scalable. Um, it's pretty efficient. Uh, and maybe just to note as well, the, the, the data for this model is also available in other formats. So if you do not have access to the Plexus commercial software, you can still access the data. And we have some folks who have imported it into Artelisa software. We're hopefully going to import it into Osmosis. So if you don't have access to, to the Plexus, don't worry, you can still access the data and you can still access a lot of the results. Uh, the Plexus software uh, can use lots of different solvers. We've tested the data on Mosaic, Express, and Garobi. We haven't. You can use some of the open source solvers as well. Uh, we have not tested on that yet. The model can be run in stochastic or deterministic fashion, and from either five minute or sixty minute resolution, depending on how long you wait or you're willing to wait for your model to run. Um, the data inputs that we use to build the model, we uh, soft link to the uh, EU reference scenario. We like the Prime's reference scenario data. Uh, it's a consistent, homogeneous data set. Uh, we have played around before with using different available uh, data sets for power plants, but we found that the data heterogeneity introduces a lot of model bias, actually. So uh, we like the EU reference scenarios. Uh, it can also be linked to times in other models, uh, but for this specific model, we pull down the power plant portfolios and industrial gas demands, residential demands from the uh, EU reference scenario. And also, this is a scenario that's consistent with, uh, with some European policy, so that, that's nice. We pull in all the gas infrastructure and storage stuff from inside InsoG. In so we get all the uh, NCTs for the, uh, the interconnectors. Uh, the wind profiles that come when you unpack the model are, are not great, so we would encourage people to use either Renewable Ninja or use the uh, JRC wind profiles. We've tested both of those. Uh, that's a really good source. Those two sources, sources are really good sources of, of wind data, and uh, the model will be improved using those. The uh, gas profiles are uh, exogenous uh, for the non elect sectors, and then for the elect sectors, it's endogenously decided within the model. When you put it all in, you get something like that. These are the uh, gas infrastructure uh, for one of the projected scenarios for 2030. You have to model stuff outside of Europe as well. You know, we have to, you have to model injection points through Ukraine, Russia, and we also model LNG uh, injection points as well. Um, with models like this, you can play around with nice stuff in terms of looking at reverse flow potential, uh, looking at where the bottlenecks are, and looking at new pipeline investments. 
the technical aspects of the model is similar to, very similar to Laurent's model. It's an integrated gas and electricity model where we model the cost and constraint of gas delivery from the sources all the way up to its uses. Um, and we have to be careful here, while it's an integrated gas and electricity model, the gas model is fairly simple, so we don't do pressure drops or we don't do uh, um, the gas dynamics, which a lot of other um, gas specific gas softwares would do. So it's, it's kind of a simple transportation algorithm uh, for gas. You can model line pack and volumes and stuff in there, but um, certainly not pressure drops. Uh, we found a lot of difficulty in trying to model the gas storages correctly. Optimization models generally are very enthusiastic and take a very uh, optimistic view of the world. Um, so what we did for the gas storages, we just downloaded historic profiles and we use those as shadow profiles. Um, so it's kind of a blended optimization simulation uh, solution. And again, the power sector stuff is all the stuff that you folks are very familiar with, you know, all the usual uh, um, uh, nuts and bolts. Uh, one of the big challenges that we had with this model before we published it was the model sensitivity. Large-scale optimization models are very complex and they're very, very challenging. And the results can be very sensitive sometimes to small changes in inputs. So we spent a lot of time trying to understand uh, what these uh, sensitive uh, inputs were, how to dampen maybe their sensitivity within the model and understand them. Um, we used the Monte Carlo analysis where essentially we ran hundreds of scenarios uh, with small changes in variable inputs and understood trying what elicited, what elicited the biggest response. Stuff that caused big movements in prices, of course, were inter interconnection capacities, uh, heat rates for coal and gas, particularly for those scenarios where gas and coal prices are similar because you can have one leaping over uh, the other. We tested on different solvers. Different solvers will give you different results and that's something that you need to deal with as well when you're, um, when you're running models like this. Uh, the model can be run in linear direct linear programming fashion or mixed integer or else uh, you can also look at a kind of a, um, a Lagrangian relaxation type run as well. What we found was in terms of electricity prices that we didn't really have a lot of strong confidence in the, the model for electricity prices. You'd have a lot more confidence in the, uh, it was the ranking of one scenario versus the other. So you have to be careful with taking absolute prices. It's the relative difference between scenarios where are the real insights. So the difference between looking for answers and looking for insights is often very important. We found that the uh, production cost data and emissions data was a lot more robust and resilient to small changes <coughs> in, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the inputs. And also you need to look at, well, how, what level of complexity should you have in a model like this? You know, it's 2030, the model that we're looking at. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty in gas prices and gas policy. So um, the need to balance model complexity with, with the inherent uncertainty in future inputs is something uh, that we're thinking quite a lot. My colleague, uh, Fiat Gaffney, will be speaking about what we've learned from this session. Uh, and he'll be presenting that at one of the focal groups, uh, focus groups uh, also tomorrow. So future work almost there. What we want to do is we love to, we have the architecture developed to add water elements uh, to this model. So we, if anybody is wants to uh, uh, wants to do this, we're delighted. Even better if anybody wants to fund this, I'd be even more uh, I'd be even more excited. Um, um, but we think the water elements is something uh, that would, in terms of modeling water at, uh, offtake and asking the question, how would the power system operate differently under water scarcity? That's a, an interesting question. Uh, we will be releasing other versions of the model during the summer. On the, at the moment, it's based on the Prime's uh, reference scenarios, or the EU reference scenarios, I guess. We'll be releasing uh, the same plug-and-play versions for the NSOE visions 1 to 4 over the summer. They're just being developed at the moment, and they'll be available to uh, everybody. Um, one of the things that we're hoping to develop, and it sounds a bit crazy, but it's, it's, uh, it might just work, is developing a global electricity model, and we're hoping to collaborate with the folks over in the World Resource Institute. Uh, check out some of the work that they've done at, uh, some of you are aware of it maybe, globalpowerwatch.org. It's a global database of, uh, of all power plants and really complements a lot of the really good work and research that's been done here on, on openness and transparency uh, um, in Europe. Finally, just to finish off, the model is available for everybody to use. You don't need to cite us, you don't need to acknowledge us. You can buy us a beer if you find it useful. Uh, but please use it, and if you use it, uh, let us know what you think of it. So, thank you very much. A couple of questions. Thank you. Very nice to the point uh, presentation. Thank you very much. 
Um, when it comes to de designing a global model, then let's go back to uh, what kind of questions would you like to answer with a global model? And specific, uh, specifically, why are there no uh, global electricity models yet? Any other question? I just have one question re regarding the link with water. Um, isn't this something that you can capture with different uh, weather patterns and precipitation? So, for instance, you capture a very hot and dry summer in your simulations, and or how do you deal with uh, that kind of uh, um, elements in your in your modeling? Yeah. So, in relation to the global electricity model, there they exist already. IA have some. There's there's some other organizations. So they do exist. Uh, they're not just publicly accessible. Um, so again, like the there are lots of other really good gas and electricity models out there. This one is just accessible to. To more people. So, with and the research question that we would like to answer with the global electricity uh, model is the idea of, of supergrids, uh, trans uh, transnational power connection. So, connecting the project that we're starting with Energy Example is called connecting the continents, and it's looking at HVDC connections between continents, uh, Asia, so Pacific, Europe to, to North America. So, it's, it's a it's a big idea, but it's uh, something that we're very uh, excited about and looking forward to doing. Uh, in relation to the water model, I guess, yeah, that would be something that we would hope to answer those questions. Particularly under scenarios of extreme water scarcity, and not just for the operation of like plants like gas and coal, but for the thermal discharge, uh, thermal pollution of particularly for you know, things like nuclear power plants, how will their operation be impacted by increasing ambient water temperatures, for example? How does that affect their cooling strategy, and how does it affect their dispatchability in countries like France, where you have a high electricity load? and you really want your nuclear to be able to, to function correctly in those times. Well, thanks a lot, um, Flo. Uh, there was another question? Yeah. It was ju just just a comment to say that uh, we're, we're working on the Power Watch thing with WRI, and we have some continental models. You're more than welcome to make them much, much better and be nice to work together. Excellent. Good.